Chris have already briefly alluded to the great difference between the Western industrial civilization and all native pre-industrial ancient cultures as far as the attitude to these holotropic states of consciousness is concerned. That all these pre-industrial cultures held these holotropic states in very high esteem. And they spent a lot of time and energy trying to develop effective and safe ways of inducing these states. And they were systematically using them as main vehicles for their ritual and spiritual life and for a variety of other things which I already mentioned, certainly for diagnosing diseases and healing, for cultivating extrasensory perception and intuition, for artistic inspiration, but also for practical purposes, finding lost objects or finding lost people or following the movement of the animals that they hunted. For Australian Aborigines, you know, finding where it's going to rain in the next few hours on their territory and so on. Now, in comparison with the situation in these native pre-industrial cultures, we have the attitude of the industrial cultures, which basically have rejected anything associated with non-ordinary states of consciousness. We have pathologized them, and we have even outlawed some of the means and some of the contexts in which they can occur or by which they can be induced. Now, what this means that we have basically pathologized the entire ritual and spiritual history of humanity because all major religions began with visionary transpersonal experiences. We can look at the history of the Buddha, you know, his six years of ascetic practice, his experience under the bow tree where he had the experience of the visitation of Kama Mara and his army and then his experience of enlightenment under the bow tree and on another occasion, the experience of past lives and liberation from the karmic bonds and so on. These are all powerful transpersonal experiences that current psychology and psychiatry would consider to be psychotic. When we look at the Bible, both the Old and the New Testament, again, we have the experience that Abraham had with God and the angel and the experience of Moses and Jehovah in the burning bush and the temptation of Jesus in the desert by the devil, the experience of Saul, the blinding vision of Jesus on the way to Damascus, the experience of St. John, the apocalyptic vision that he had on the island of Patmos in his cave. Those are all powerful mystical experiences. The so-called miraculous journey of Muhammad, where he had the vision of Archangel Gabriel who took him on this trip through the seven heavens into the Muslim paradise and into Jehenna, into hell and his experience with Allah when he got the articles of the Quran in a state that was described as ecstasy approaching annihilation. In the same way, the Mormon religion is based on a direct visionary experience and certainly many other religious systems. Now, Western psychiatry attributes these experiences to psychosis. We have many articles, many books, which talk about the best possible diagnosis for just about every founder of a major religion or a saint or a prophet. St. Teresa of Avila was called a hysterical psychotic. St. John of the Cross has been called hereditary degenerative. Ramakrishna's experiences were attributed to psychosis. Mohammed's experiences were attributed to epilepsy because he had some kind of seizure-like manifestations. Anthropologists have been discussing what would be the best diagnosis for shamans. Are they schizophrenics? Are they ambulant psychotics? Are they severe hysterics? Are they maybe also epileptics because they have some kind of a seizure-like manifestation? There's even one paper by Franz Alexander, one of the founders of psychosomatic medicine, a famous psychoanalyst, where even meditation is pathologized. He wrote a paper called the Buddhist training is artificial catatonia. Now, if this is true, that the experiences of these people were nothing but schizophrenic, psychotic experiences, how do we explain that they had such a powerful impact, that they inspired millions of more or less normal people, that they inspired incredible architecture, incredible art, paintings, 
music, sculptures, and that they were such a driving force of human history. We can't imagine that this would be possible unless the whole transpersonal spiritual dimension is an extremely relevant dimension in the depth of the human psyche. I would like to from here go to Michael Harner, an anthropologist of good academic standing who also had a shamanic initiation when he worked in the Amazon. And he, in his book, The Way of the Shaman, looks at Western psychology and psychiatry and says that they're biased in two different ways. One of these biases he calls ethnocentric, which means this is a perspective on the human psyche and mental health and disease held and developed by one particular group of people, which is the industrial civilization. And this group considers its own perspective to be absolutely superior to any other group who has ever existed throughout history. And everything that these people are doing that doesn't make sense to us in terms of Freudian analysis or behaviorism would be seen as either superstition, primitive magical thinking, or if it involves direct experiences, of spiritual realities, it would be seen as gross pathology. The second bias that Michael Harner talks about, he calls cognicentric, probably a better word would be pragmacentric. What he means by that is that when we were formulating our psychological theories, we took into consideration only experiences and observations made in the ordinary states of consciousness. And we have systematically censored out everything that came out from the study of non-ordinary states, whether it came from historians, people doing comparative religion, from anthropologists, or even from our contemporary research, like anything that has been written in psychedelic literature. Everything has been written off. None of it has been taken into consideration. Everything that parapsychologists have described and discovered, everything coming from experiential forms of psychotherapy, from transpersonal psychology, but then particularly from thanatology, where we have very fascinating observations suggesting, for example, that it's possible for people who are in an out-of-body state, a disembodied consciousness, can have accurate perception of not only the immediate environment, but also frequently from a very remote environment. And this can happen even with people who are congenitally blind and have never seen anything in their whole life. So now the question arises, what would be then psychiatry and psychology that would not be ethnocentric, that would be applicable to all human groups and would be culturally sensitive? It would be treating with respect ritual and spiritual life of different cultures. And also psychology and psychiatry that would not be cognicentric or pragmacentric. That means it would really systematically study and incorporate the experiences and the observations from non-ordinary states. So I can think here about maybe four or five different areas in which we would have to radically change our thinking, and we will explore them all in some detail. The first one is we would need a much larger cartography of the psyche. Our current cartography is limited to postnatal biography, things that happened to us in infancy, childhood, and later, and to the Freudian so-called individual unconscious, which is also in a way related to postnatal biography. We would need a much, much bigger image of the human psyche, a very different model. We would also, and this is the second area where we would have to change our thinking, we would see very differently what it means to have emotional and psychosomatic disorders, what they mean and how deep their roots reach. 